good day and welcome to Excelsior Classes. I am your host, Julie Rohr, and you are joining us for our monthly content expert webinar series. It is March 2019, and we are joined by Melissa Kaiser, Excelsior Classes' very own architecture expert. Melissa holds a master's degree in architectural design and has taught at Judson University. Additionally, she teaches her own four children and has taught students from kindergarten through eighth grade in various topics of art and architecture. We hope you'll enjoy this virtual rapid fire tour through three major cities in Italy and some of the beautiful architecture that can be found in them. If you have any further questions for Mrs. Kaiser, please feel free to contact her here at Excelsior Classes. And remember, you can take any of her classes beginning this fall with Intro to Architecture 1. For now, sit back and enjoy our presentation already in progress. The, um, the, the topic tonight is, uh, is inspired by my recent research because of a trip that we'll be taking this spring. My husband is an architecture professor and we will be accompanying him as he takes his students on a study tour of Italy. And uh, that's the place that you want to go when you're studying architecture. If we look at this map of Italy, you can see the three cities that we'll be visiting this evening, Rome, Florence, and Venice. And architecture uh, is a result of a lot of influences. And, and mainly in these cities, you see um, some specific things. In Rome, it was the imperial city and the current capital. Venice was uh, a, um, a, a center of banking and wealth. And Venice was a port city. So it was a town that um, had uh, trade and the home of merchants. And so all of these things and more influence the kind of architecture that we see uh, in these cities. So let's start. Let's start in Rome. And the, we, can't, we can't really talk about Italian architecture at this point because Italy wasn't, wasn't a country until um, about the 19th century. So you had different regions and kingdoms and city-states. So in Rome, what you have is Roman architecture. And the Pantheon is the finest example uh, intact of Roman architecture. And what you see here, is the influence of the Greeks who had started building architecture even centuries before. You see the columns and the temple front, and then you see the invention of the Romans. So the arches and the vaults, the circular drum, and then the dome. So this is a building that is a temple. The Pantheon is a temple to all the gods. And um, it's, it's the first example where we see a dome used on a temple building. And it, it's, it's the largest dome that you will find of its type. So one of the other innovations of the Romans in architecture was their uh, materials. This building is made largely out of concrete. And um, that allowed it to be strong and to have longer spans and um, to be built a little bit faster as well. Um, the, the interior space is, a, is a, a, the geometry that will hold a perfect sphere. So in, in antiquity, classical times, geometry was very important in the design of buildings. And so you have a, a, a perfect sphere that can be contained within the interior. And as the dome uh, is so large and heavy, you have these pockets called coffers that were taken out of or subtracted from really the material <clears throat> as it was built so that it would be a little bit lighter. And then you have these ribs that essentially kind of form the structure and then bear up on these walls around the edges. These walls were very, very thick, like 26 feet thick. And that's because they bear all the weight of the building. But you can see how 
there were arches and vaults carved into that to take away some of the weight as well. And these coffers um, provide a really excellent play of light and shadow. The oculus at the top of the dome is the only source of natural light that comes into the Pantheon. And so it casts its light and shadow along the interior. We have some other examples here of ancient Roman architecture. Um, the Colosseum is really one of the best examples of Roman engineering. It was so big. It could hold 50 to 75,000 spectators for um, the events that they held at the Colosseum. So those were things like battles and contests, the gladiatorial things that you've heard about, and um, some very um, unfortunate uh, treatment of Christians occurred here in this Colosseum. <clears throat> However, we do uh, see the, the, the demonstration of the Roman engineering with the arches and the, the, the oval structure. So it was, it's the, the prime example of a theater space. And we even look to it today to look at the, the geometry of how the, the Colosseum was structured. And it was built with concrete as well. And they would, they would make the, the underneath structure out of concrete. And then they would put stone and, and uh, at, like granite and marble or, or stucco over the top of it to make it look nicer on the outside. And then you have the Roman Forum, <clears throat> which is the place where Julius Caesar walked. And it is in ruins now. But um, this is... This is where people of, so Rome was a republic, right? Before it was an empire. This is where people would gather to vote and to talk about the new laws. And it, it, it was where the Senate was held as well. And um, so then Julius Caesar came onto the scene and, and he started kind of replanning and restructuring it to, to prioritize the place of the Senate and the, the ruling um, parties so that the the vote of the people was was less emphasized and so these are all things that that happen with architecture this is also where we see the earliest example of the basilica building type so the basilica building type was used later for a church for churches and because it was a it's a meeting space so it was kind of like a long rectangular space you can you can see the front of a building here. You can't really see much there. We'll see basilica building types later. Then you have St. Peter's Basilica, which is, is right next to the Vatican. So the Vatican would be over next to St. Peter's and where the Pope gives his address. And um, so this is the, the Catholic Church in Rome. And it's, it was designed by an architect named Bramante in, um, in the Renaissance style, but then he passed away and it was handed off to Michelangelo. And um, Michelangelo mainly designed the dome and he was inspired by a, a dome that came before it from the city of Florence that we will also look at. But um, this really, it was, it was kind of the, the focal point of the city of Rome. So you can see how it looks out over the city here. This is a view from the dome, looking through the square. I don't know why it's called a square, it's an oval. Looking out into the city, but from the city, you see this dome. So he made it a little more pointed. It's not a hemispherical dome like the Pantheon. <clears throat> it's a little more pointed. And so it, it really garners that attention. And then you can, um, you can see the, the plaza out in front of St. Peter's was designed a little bit later by an architect named Bernini. So he was a sculptor and an architect. And you'll find that it's very common in the Renaissance for artists, sculptors, architects, they all kind of collaborated. And so you'll find some that were more than just one thing. And that was the case with Michelangelo as well. You will find the famous Sistine Chapel ceiling right next to St. Peter's, right here. 
And this is the creation of Adam, where you have God stretching out his finger and Adam stretching out his finger here. <clears throat> We're missing a picture. Well, anyway, these are examples of Baroque architecture in Rome. We don't see a lot of the Renaissance in Rome. That was really in Florence. But those, we, we, what we just saw was high Renaissance. And then we have the Baroque. Um, so this, this is the Trevi Fountain. And it is uh, part of a Baroque urban plan. So if you think of maybe Washington DC and the, the plazas and the radiating streets, that's like a Baroque urban plan. Uh, here they already had the streets, but they wanted to kind of tie them together and create urban spaces. And so they would, they would do that with, with plazas. In Italian, it's called piazza. And so the Trevi Fountain became a focal element on the edge of this piazza <clears throat> and um, it was it was constructed and designed in the baroque style baroque you see um you see more flourish curvier elements more detail and fussy stuff going on and here we have depicted a um a mythological scene that just has a lot of action and dynamism, which was also typical of the Baroque style and the, the waters cascading down. And so it, it just created um, a, 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 a space full of life in this piazza. And then we have the Jubilee Church, which is a more recent building, and it's just outside of Rome in one of the Roman suburbs. And this was part of an initiative that Pope John Paul II had for the millennium to revitalize the Catholic Church um, life in Rome. <clears throat> he wanted something new and fresh that would um, inspire people. And architecture does that, especially places where people gather. So uh, he held a competition and the designs were submitted. Richard Meyer is the architect. He's an, an, an American architect who won this competition. And so you see the um, you see the curved panels here made out of concrete, which, which these remind me of the Pantheon actually. Um, but we also have a shape, uh, the, an overall shape that's based on the geometry of squares and circles. And so we also see that reference to the classical with the use of pure geometries. Here are some a photo from the other side where you can see its place in the community. These are apartment buildings um, behind the church. It forms a, a, there's a plaza and a community center that are all part of this site. And then the interior space here. <clears throat> and next, we move on to Florence. Florence was the birthplace of the Renaissance. And here, right here, in the Florence Cathedral is where it happened for architecture. This cathedral, uh, there were other cathedrals on this site before this time. This was typical uh, with cities that uh, have existed for a long time. Uh, things fall down and they rebuild them. Uh, and they rebuild them in the, the, the style that is typical of the time. <clears throat> so uh, when this uh, cathedral was rebuilt. It was rebuilt in the Italian Gothic style, so about a hundred years before this date here. And the Italian Gothic was much different actually than the French Gothic. French Gothic you might think of just very tall spires and flying buttresses, but here in Italian Gothic uh, the bays were wider. It wasn't, wasn't quite as vertical uh, in appearance. You can still see some of the points and the arches and the ribs. <clears throat> but um, the architect who, who planned this church here um, did that in the Italian Gothic style and it was, it was designed uh, to, be, it, to be very, very large. So Florence was experiencing a time of, of growth and prosperity and they wanted all of their people and people of surrounding areas to be able to come to this church. And 
<clears throat> so as they started building it and it's been a hundred years and so the architect is now gone and no one is sure how they're going to put a dome on it because it's so large. There hasn't been anything before this time that has been this big. So they held a competition to see uh, who, who would have the best idea about how to put a dome on this cathedral. And uh, a man by the name of Filippo Bernaleschi, who was not an architect actually, but was a, a math and science genius, sort of like da Vinci, I guess, um, had the best plan for that. And the reason is that he looked back to the designs of antiquity. He looked specifically at the Pantheon. He went and he studied it because, because its dome was of similar size. Uh, not quite as tall. It wasn't as high off the ground. This, the, the overall height of this dome is about 376 feet. So just imagine like a 37-story building, and that's how tall that would be. <clears throat> but he went to Rome and he studied the Pantheon and how that dome was constructed. And, he, and of course, it was in a classical style. So he came back and proposed the design for this dome in the classical style. And then the stonemasons who were building and finishing the church also turned to the classical style as they are building. And all of a sudden uh, we have the Renaissance where we, um, we bring back the classical design of the proportions and the pure geometry of the elements. And so then, um, he went on from here. Well, let's look at the inside first. First you see under the dome, the beautiful frescoes that um, were done by artists of the time. Again, artists, sculptors, architects all collaborated in works in the Renaissance. The interior of, of the church you can see in the Gothic style, really, the, uh, the ribbed vaults. These are called groin vaults as they come together, vaults from the side to um, and in a perpendicular with the vault running back and forth. <clears throat> he went on to, um, to create other Renaissance works, such as Santo Spirito, which the interior is supposedly the, the greatest example of Renaissance church architecture. And we'll see that in the next slide. But he also inspired others, such as Alberti, who created this um, basilica front called Santa Maria Novella. The, the basilica style, which I had mentioned, uh, that you see at the Forum, the Roman Forum, was a meeting hall style. It was tall down the middle, and, then, and that's called the nave of the church, and then it had these side aisles, which were shorter. Uh, the churches also had a transept, which, is a, which was a crossing perpendicular. So in plan, the, the churches were like crosses. But um, the front of this was designed in a Renaissance style, which, which made very, very intricate use of proportion. So um, all of the pieces and the elements here are, are mathematically proportional. <clears throat> and here you can see the interiors. You can you notice the difference between this one in which the, the, the church part itself was built in a little bit earlier Gothic style and just the facade was built in the Renaissance style. And then here we have the Renaissance interior, the prime example of Renaissance church interior. And here we have the Basilica of San Lorenzo. So we're still in Florence. And <clears throat> this site where this basilica is, is standing is the oldest church site in Florence. So it dates back to the early Christian period, like the fourth century actually. And the churches have been built and, and rebuilt over the years. This one <clears throat> was again built by Brunelleschi. It's argued to be the largest one or the old, I'm sorry, the oldest one, the um, Florence Cathedral is the largest, but the, the, oldest, um, the oldest site. And so Brunelleschi kind of fixed this one up and he fixed up the interior in the Renaissance style. 
And then, um, so this was commissioned by the Medicis, who were the aristocratic family of Florence. Um, the, the aristocrats were the patrons of the arts and of architecture. Architecture was built by, by emperors and popes and aristocrats. You had to have the money. And so the Medicis eventually became popes. And they decided they wanted a library to house um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the writings of the time because the, the manuscript, like the manuscripts of the church, because the Reformation was happening and they needed some intellectual ammunition and they, they wanted to house it right there. And it was, it was also kind of symbolic of we know what we're talking about. So they commissioned Michelangelo to design a library that would go um, right here on top of the cloister. This is called, this, this colony down here is called the cloister of, of the church. And so the library is right here on top of that. And by this time now, we are in high Renaissance style. So we are at very precise uh, mathematical proportions. It's, it's almost very stark in some ways. <clears throat> the uh, the cross section of this library is like a perfect square, and um and you can just see the 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 perfect geometries. The 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 stairway leading up to this library is 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 a really big deal too. I, I didn't think it was slide worthy though. I, it it doesn't look as impressive as as the the proportions of it are. And then we move on to Venice. And when we get to Venice, this is the big deal right here, the Piazza San Marco. <clears throat> it's, the, it's the largest civic space in Venice. <clears throat> and the, the Campanile right here is the focal point of the city. And so this, this, this civic space has existed since the beginning of the time of the city. Um, and it just kind of developed and changed through the years. But here along this side, you have the Doge's palace. The Doge was like the Duke. He was kind of the, the leader of the city. Remember that it wasn't Italy, it was Venice and sort of the Venetian kingdom or territory. And so this was his palace. And then he had a church over here, St. Mark's Basilica, which, um, had occupied that site since I think it was the fifth century and uh, to house the relics of St. Mark. So <clears throat> an interesting thing about Venice is that it's a, it's a port city. So it's, it's, it's an island basically. And as such, uh, it, there, it, it was a shipping center or a trade port. So it had a lot of connection with, the um the eastern roman empire which was um which was um byzantine so you can see that influence in the architecture you can see the the arches or domes are a little pointed you can see the gold gilt um on the inside they have mosaics instead of frescoes and so again the byzantine influence so <clears throat> we also have just across the canal from that point, from St. Mark's Plaza, these churches, which are the work of Andre Palladio. And what Palladio did, and this is, this is late Renaissance. So we've been working with the, he'd been working with the Basilica church type for a while. And this is like the prime example of, of his, his work. So he figured out how you put a facade or a front or a face on this building type. So remember when we looked at Santo Spirito and Santa Maria Novella, and they had the circles and the scrolls in the corners here. This, this was a, this was a problem, the way that the tall nave was connected with the side aisles um, in when designing the front of the church. So what he did was he superimposed two temple fronts. So you see one temple front 
for the lower portion and then another temple front for the taller portion. And he basically just, just layered one on top of the other. And so that was his great contribution to that architectural style. It's, it's, um, he went on to uh, design the Villa Rotunda, Villa La Rotunda in Vicenza, which is just outside of Venice. It was a country residence of one of the city aristocrats. And so it was built to enjoy the view of the landscape all around it. And so here again, we're using very strict proportions and geometries. And so this is, it's set up on a pedestal to, to have a commanding view of the landscape. And then it uses a temple because we're, we're in the Renaissance still, which we're looking back to antiquity and using the classical style. So it has a temple front portico, which looks out each direction into the landscape. And then in this design, he also incorporated the use of a dome. Palladio found a relationship between um, the dome and its Latin name, domus, which means home. And so he, he wanted to incorporate the two. And in this example, he uses a dome on a villa. I think um, one of the most interesting things about the way he did this was he used uh, the, the musical scale. So the scale of eighths, sixteenths, fourths, halves to govern the proportions that he used. And so proportions would basically be the, the height to the width or the spacing of the windows or the columns or the ratios, the mathematical ratios between the sizes of the elements used. And this building was the inspiration for Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, the, the villa that he built for himself. So <clears throat> that wraps it up. And hopefully you have had a little bit of a taste of the, um, the architecture of Italy. And um, you will eventually get to enjoy a, uh, a trip there yourself. So. Did anybody have any questions for Mrs. Kaiser? If you had to pick one of those three cities and only one, which one would you pick? Florence, hands down. Because? Florence has all of the beauty. It has, um, it has urban life, but it also has, um, it has more of the Renaissance beauty. Uh, the, the, um, it's a little bit smaller than Rome. Rome, Rome is kind of a tough, city in in parts and I I just I enjoyed being in Florence more um yeah so Florence. and Venice Venice is beautiful but it's smaller and there isn't quite as much to see in Venice I mean obviously there is plenty but not as much as there is in Florence Florence you have all of the Renaissance masters and um just lots of lots of great inspiration very cool. Michelangelo David is there. What else could you want? <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you so much. And in the fall, you will be teaching architecture one and spring you'll do architecture two. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Okay. And um, what is a good age range for that? Since we have some students watching, what's a good age range if they want to learn more about architecture? <laughs> yes. Yes. I would love to have you. It is best for juniors and seniors in high school. Okay. We do rely pretty heavily on some mathematical concepts, as you could hear as we were discussing the buildings. Um, but it's a very hands-on class, a lot of drawing, and um, we do some drafting with a drafting board and T-square and triangles. And then we also use a 3D modeling program on the computer. So it, it really is, it's a class for you to get a taste of whether pursuing it in college is something that you would enjoy. So you have to be kind of, kind of thinking about that already. 
Well, that sounds good. We have some discussion going on in our chat of who thinks they're going to be there and who's not, but. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you everybody very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Kaiser, for sharing that with us. And it makes us all want to go there on our Excelsior break next week. So. Yes, it was been, my pleasure. Been there in my dreams tonight. And, um, and we will look forward to maybe another one in the fall. Maybe we'll hear some more about your visit. I don't know. Um, oh, that would be great. That would be super. I was going to tell everybody uh, who came tonight, uh, maybe, maybe you need to brush up on math to get ready for Mrs. Kaiser's class. <laughs> <laughs> but next month for our content expert webinar, um, a month from now, we're going to hear from one of our new teachers, Judy Frank. And Mrs. Frank is an excellent math teacher and tutor. And so she's going to be tackling a subject that to some may sound enthralling and others may sound scary, but I would encourage all of you to come back and see it. Algebra, why students need it, can do it, and even like it. So there's something to look forward to, right? See if she's That's ready. Right. <laughs> so if you'd like to join us next month, I'm sure we'll see an announcement about that. Uh, that meeting, um, I see somebody asking, that meeting is about one month from now. We usually hold these on the third Thursday of the week, of the month, but next month, because of the Easter holiday week beginning, we will be holding it on Wednesday. But you'll see announcements go out from Excelsior to remind you of that. Okay? Thank you so much. I invite you guys to just come back in a month or keep an eye out for Mrs. Kaiser's shout outs that she occasionally has on Facebook. And um, wish you all a good evening. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone.